This is, in fact, the final week of Progressive Christianity Bible Study. Um, and Hi, Catherine. Had a discussion. I know we missed. Hi, Catherine. Glad you could join us. Um, uh, I just pressed record, Catherine, for your very arrival. I did, in fact, miss the first half hour of this, but that's all right. Um, and we, our core value today, let me just put it up on the screen once more. We've had a little bit of discussion on this already. Um, <clears throat> But is uh, by calling ourselves progressive Christians, we mean that we are Christians who commit to a path of lifelong learning, believing that there is more value in questioning than in absolutes. And one of the things that we have discussed at this point is how Christianity has taken a diversion from our Jewish roots. Um, uh, within the Jewish tradition, there is a practice of interacting with the biblical text uh, called Midrash. And Midrash is a way of um, a way of interacting with sacred text that absolutely um, uh, honors questions, <laughs> honors diversity in, in interpretation, and is a core uh, value within Judaism that has been shed um, within our own Christian tradition. I will say it is progressive Christian biblical scholars that have sought to kind of revive that tradition within Christianity. And I, I hope to goodness that it takes hold, not just within the halls of academia, in our churches as well, because again, I think it honors this very last part. It's a path of lifelong learning. It's a path of curiosity. It's a path of questioning. And it sees questioning as something that is joyful and life-giving and necessary um, when it comes to a life of faith and not something that poses a threat to, um, to scripture or to our God, who is, of course, much bigger than our, our biblical witness that we have in our hand. Okay. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. yes. So are y'all up to speed, Catherine? Yeah. <laughs> Testimony to that, Emma. Yes. Did you not, oh, I'm talking to the whole group, did you not feel a sense of joy um, yesterday in church when... Tyler was able to take uh, a scripture that we probably have never read <laughs> since some points in Joshua, uh, but and was able to pull out of that scripture a truth about today that binary thinking doesn't have any place in human history and in, in human life. Yeah. And and he took that little kernel of of the answer not being yes or no, and yeah. and and just drew the whole thing of why we no longer think there's only heterosexual and homosexual. We no longer think there's only black and only white. We no longer think there's only small and large. I mean, the whole life has just. But yesterday, when when he said that. It was like my whole insides began to dance. That, that little, <laughs> I like that too. <laughs> <laughs> that tiny little kernel of, of uh, what did he read from? Judges. Judges. No, uh, Joshua. 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 Yeah. Joshua. Yeah, Joshua. Right. Judges. Right. It was in Joshua. It was Joshua. Story five, Joshua. One, two, uh, three. Three. Gosh, we don't study those mm -hmm. Old Testament texts. Mm -hmm. And here's the truth. But the other thought that I have, and I have to share it or I'll lose it, is that Midrash was very important to, to Jews mm -hmm. and continues to be, where the scripture is talked about, the sermon is talked about, pulled apart, where's the new learning, et cetera, et cetera. Well, then when Western Europe thinking came into the mix, mm. That construct fell away and Herr Pastor took over 
and church architecture began to have elevated pulpit and, and the people sitting down here like sponges mm. expected to soak up whatever hair pastor had to say. So our worship in the Judaic Christian tradition has gone from what we saw in Israel mm. as one of the oldest synagogues with the stone bench going all the way around where the rabbi was, where the rock was with the wine and the bread. So we can, and now in 21st century, we thought that churches in the round were a novel idea. Well, guess what? They're 2,000 years old. Right, right. Yeah, I, I love that. And I think this, uh, we've, we've so much to learn from our um, Jewish, uh, What's the best way to put it? I mean, the, the I mean, the Jewish roots of the Christian faith. I mean, Jesus again. We really can't never get away from the fact that Jesus is a Jew. Right. You really just can't get away from it. And there's tons of books by Mark, I think Marcus Borg mostly, um, or Spong. Spong wrote a bunch about the Hebrew Hebrew Jesus, and um, anyway. All of that's so fascinating, and it's, it's part of that wider movement that we've mentioned at different points of the, the kind of historical critical um, uh, movement. There's attention to detail around archaeology about who these people were, where the context in which they grew, they they were living, the the political context, the the reality of the world they lived in shaped kind of their way of being in the world, just like ours does, like just like the fact that we've grown up um in this world that is fast paced um is again always changing it feels like it feels like i mean we are in fact in the fastest changing time in human history um and it's only going to increase and this includes like the increasing amount of information from every field of study from science to theology from space travel to archaeology from the smallest cell to like new ways of understanding myth as part of culture and um and so this idea that progressive christianity begins with the assumption that nothing is permanent that everything changes uh we kind of assume that it is the responsibility of every individual to avail themselves with an open mind to as much of this information as possible and always ask the challenging question, does this uh, new information change my understanding of faith? And allowing that dialogue to happen and not seeing it as something that might threaten it or tear it down. Because the minute we feel that we might be threatened, we shut down. And um, again, I listened to a sermon today in one of my cohorts, and it was a preacher talking about the Good Shepherd. And um, he, one of his statements within the sermon says, uh, we need to, rem oh, um, it was about walls and gate, like I am the gate, uh, piece of scripture. And he says, Jesus didn't come and say, I am the wall that protects all the things important to you. I am the gate. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I thought, oh boy, like opening up ourselves to other possibilities, taking in the new information, allowing our faith to be questioned, allowing our faith to be questioned, allowing those doctrines, those values, those beliefs to be questioned. And again, it does open ourselves up to the criticism that is often lobbed against progressive and liberals is that, oh, you stand for nothing. Oh, you're open to anything. Oh, it's wishy-washy. You're not really taking a stand for anything. But I want to say, no, no, no. Like, that is a cop-out. That is an absolute cop-out. And we have found that to be true over the last five weeks as we've begun to talk about these core values. That actually these values aren't a just that anything goes. These are robust values that um, demand a lot of attention, <laughs> demand a lot of um, questioning, demand a lot from us intellectually, emotionally, culturally, socially, in order to live out in the world. And so 
taking on this information, allowing our faith to be questioned, allowing our faith to question other things, and allowing it to be a reciprocal process is something that is so core to what it means to be a progressive Christian, um, to practice a progressive Christianity that, um, again, understands, uh, again, begins with the assumption that nothing is permanent, that actually the thing that I hold dear can, in fact, change. And that that's not inherently a bad thing. Um, Do you think that Martin Luther was mm -hmm. the... Which one? The tip of this. Martin Luther, the original. Okay. <laughs> the German guy. <laughs> yeah. Was the tip of the sword here? Maybe. I mean, uh, again, the whole Reformation, the kind of the idea of sola scriptura, now the scripture is in the hands of the people, in the hands of the masses really did return to be clear well again go back to ancient judaism when it's again oral tradition again stories passed to one another uh, there is an inherent malleability to the stories and myths and traditions that were told and passed on the the kind of hair pastor but prior to that of course we've got popes <laughs> um of course, uh, and the elite within the church institution who would, again, dispense truth from the pulpit. This is what scripture says, and this is what it means, and this is how you should interpret it. And this is the capital T meaning of this particular parable or this particular gospel story or this particular Old Testament account. And then what the reformers did, of course, oh, now that we have the printing press and you have people, the masses, have the ability to read and understand scripture in your own vernacular, in your language. Um, what it opened up was the possibility for multiple interpretations. But of course, that is a double-edged sword for the reformers. I don't know that the reformers, Martin Luther... Uh, included could conceive of the world that we live in right now mm -hmm. right no but the sheer, i mean the multiplicity of interpretations has just been blown way out of the water right <laughs> luther and the rest of his contemporary reformers or at least the reformers in that two to three hundred year period um i don't know that they that they would prescribe to what we are talking about right now. I agree. And in I fact, not only do they not agree with what we're doing now, they didn't agree with what the Anabaptists were doing then. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Only adult baptism. And people who were not thinking in line with the Catholics, but more like Luther, could find themselves killed. Mm -hmm. but, who were thinking like the Catholics and thinking like Luther might also kill the Catholics. Oh, but who do they both dislike? The Anabaptists. Oh, <laughs> Nobody likes them coming in. And yeah. in Virginia, when we were a colony, we took Baptists and put them in prison. <laughs> right. For being Baptists. For being Baptists. That's right. Yeah. Good place for them. <laughs> I, it, it seems, and but, I understand and that, how I agree with them, but uh, yeah, I've been trying to say something, Lynn. Oh yes, Lynn. Well, I was trying to say something earlier, but I, I was just trying to had had been saying that when that I, that I that when this whole business is about questioning and everything, and the business of the Jewish faith and about this this core value that you brought up i was brought back to my confirmation class and i may have said this early on i can't remember uh but one of the young guys in the class kept he, i mean he didn't really want to be there and was being forced to be there by his parents and he questioned everything the minister said and he was questioning all of it and he basically told him it was okay to question he thought he was going to get out of it because he was saying that he was going to like the pastor would kick him out but he didn't he said no this is good and we're going to talk about it and he said like questioning was good and so I guess I came early to questioning yeah. about that this is what we're supposed to do that you're not supposed to just blindly believe something and 
I also think that this is not only where we come today in the Christian faith, um, like it's progressive Christians, but also across our country, particularly the, the differences that we see, this whole business about absolutes, that it carries over into, to, to me anyway, mine is that some of this business carries over into you know, politics and everything else, that everything has to be such an absolute, everything has to be such black and white, and that people are, feel safe with that. And when there's too much gray, they get afraid, and then they don't know what to do, and they don't want to have anything. They also don't want it to change. They want everything to be the same. And, you know, as the old saying goes, the only thing that's constant is change, you know. Well, and and the the answer, the absolute, is really the illusion okay. of control, the illusion that there is, in fact, an answer, um, and and the 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 kind of the 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 desire to not have everything change is also an illusion because nobody, nobody with their eyes open can say that like nothing changed like everything's changed every individual has changed and so like this desire for things not to change is a kind of misnomer like that, that it's just not possible it's just not possible you're asking for a fantasy that is just not real right and so if we are to approach um ourselves and this world and this life um honestly <laughs> then we have to reckon with change and we have to reckon with questions that don't have easy answers and we have to we have to I think hold in suspicion in a kind of a in an academic sense suspicion I don't want you to be going through suspicions of everything but like in in an academic sense to, to be suspicious of those who claim to have the answers right um and that's okay. I think this is why we're practicing asking questions of our own scripture, um, as we kind of exercise that muscle a little bit as well. But um, to move on, so progressive Christianity begins with the assumption that nothing is permanent, that everything changes. Um, and progressive Christianity believes as well that such a stance uh, towards the world and our faith is a stance that follows the example of Jesus to circle all the way back to core value number one. <laughs> According to the Gospels, uh, Jesus rarely gave a straight answer to a straight question. Uh, instead, he responded with another question or told uh, like a puzzling story that, that even the disciples were just like, what do you mean? <laughs> and at risk of disappointing his questioners, Jesus put them in a position of having to think for themselves um, rather than offer his disciples answers to life's most perplexing problems Jesus introduced them to a deeper and deeper level of ambiguity and this reminded me of like the sermon I told with the um iceberg on the front of the um bulletin that actually what Jesus uh, requires of us so much in the way that he um taught and the way that he behaved in the world was require us again to like dig deeper to that mass that we like to keep hidden under the surface of the water um because we're afraid of what might uh i don't know might show up <laughs> and that we might have to question um and so Jesus's very example way of being in the world, the collection that we have of Jesus' teachings in the in the uh, Gospels, kind of taught us and taught his disciples, or original disciples, to kind of question the most basic principles of their own faith, of the Jewish faith, of the law, of laws that concern murder and adultery and retribution and giving and prayer Jesus would not provide absolute answers on any of those things uh, he said uh, in yeah. the fourth century our dear Augustine began to state a number of absolutes which we know which we no longer would accept well and it turns out the greatest thinkers in our own tradition have have still have this human desire for certainty, for absolutes, right? Even our greatest thinkers. 
And again, you are absolutely within your right to hang your hat on Augustine's uh, thinking and his theology. Be my guest. What we're saying in this Bible study, at least, is progressive Christianity says, um, uh, says I don't know if that's helpful anymore. Are you finding that helpful? Are you finding absolutes helpful? Are you finding absolutes uh, life-giving for you as you go through life? Um, are the answers that you've been provided by preachers, theologians, TV evangelists, the world at large, how are they working for you? Um, and progressive Christianity says, well, if you are someone for whom it's not working, <laughs> then you can still call yourself a Christian and do so in the knowledge that you are following the example of Jesus and having more questions than answers. Um, and that to me gives me hope for Christianity in the future. Christianity will survive this day and age when our institutions are failing, Christianity will go on. The God that our Christianity points to or seeks to point to will not be deterred by the failing of our 21st century religious institutions and the way that we've conceived of them, the way that we've invested our money in it. It will go on. Our buildings might be, um, our buildings might, be empty and we might meet in different ways and I feel like if if we were to meet without the burden of our buildings or without salaries and utilities to think of what way if we were unencumbered by all those things how would we seek to practice Christian community it might look a whole lot different and so we are both the beneficiaries of the past and and also burdened by the past. And I don't mean just kind of our immediate past, but I mean uh, our theologians like dear Augustine <laughs> um, or Martin Luther, these um, spearheaders of our faith um, and that we have gained so much from them. But yet we have we have got a we have got a task for our own age. Um, and I think Laurie quoted another um, theologian on Sunday at the ordination, uh, Carolyn Lewis, who said, tradition is only peer pressure from de dead people. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know that I conceive of tradition quite that bluntly, but sometimes we allow tradition to be peer pressure from dead people. <laughs> And if tradition is in fact that, then sometimes we need permission to be freed from that. You no longer need to be feel peer pressured to hold the beliefs, the values, the doctrines, the way of being church, the way of practicing as your forebearers did. You don't. Um, Jesus though a Jew and though dearly held on and was a Jew up until he died through his death and resurrection, Jesus was never anything other than a Jew. Um, and so he held on to his religious and faith tradition deeply. But he questioned some of the traditions. Huh? He questioned some of the traditions. Every single one of them. And so do not feel peer pressured by de dead people. Take Take what is good, what is life-giving, what is wise, and question the rest. What, what risk are you running? I think sometimes we believe as Christians, oh my gosh, I can't possibly do that, right? Why would be my question. Anyway, okay. Um, let me keep it. What time are we? 7.30. Lord help us. We've been here an hour. Okay. I was going to say. Yes, Rick. That what I talked about yesterday in church seems to follow along exactly with this sixth. Yes. Yes. What link are you seeing, Rick? Say that again. What link, what connection specifically do you see? Uh, well, my objective was to 
try to get people to think in a broader way than we're used to thinking about mental health. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that seems to follow along with the idea. I mean, that if you think of our past ways of thinking about mental health as an absolute, mm -hmm. then I was saying that's not necessarily the best, the only way to think about it. And I tried to present a new, a different way. Yeah. To I think you're absolutely time. right. Yes, absolutely right. And not only does it honor this particular core value, but last week's as well about honoring contemporary science, new discoveries about how the brain works, how our hormones work, how circumstances and different things impact those things over our lifetimes offers us new insight on our mental health that that gives gives us pause and need to question um what we previously held as true because if we don't question it we keep ourselves kind of captive to a way of thinking a way of believing that is deeply harmful to us and i think that is both true for our mental health as it is for the beliefs that we hold um, that pertain to our faith. Um, so yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Okay, so I'm trying to think about which question, I'm trying to, I'm trying to edit as we go along. Um, and perhaps actually, since we've only got half an hour to go, we really just jump straight to the scripture. Um, but I do wanna just make sure that I'm not missing anything vast you will have noticed i think in previous weeks that this particular curriculum that was written by um uh progressive christianity.org it's a website you can find tons of articles and it's it was like a board of theologians and 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 thinkers and biblical scholars who kind of cr created this um uh for just what we're doing for for a broader discussion on progressive christianity um I think I lost my train of thought, but um, I just wanted to make sure. Oh, yeah, the, the the word that they used to describe God was infinite mystery. They used that title consistently throughout this curriculum, um, which really wraps up a lot of our core values really nicely. If we can conceive of God as an infinite mystery. I think, um, and I think I've tried to do that in my own faith journey um, to remind myself, particularly through seminary, but as someone who who is animated by kind of uh, church life and, and things like that, is that we get hung up on words and get hung up on meaning and get hung up on all these sort of things. And um, infinite mystery reminds me that I will never know. I will never know. And that is both infuriating and a deep relief. I wouldn't say that. Perhaps in death you will know. Oh, maybe. Oh, and maybe I hold out for that. So don't say never. <laughs> right. Well, okay. So this side of death, I will never know. Uh, maybe I'll be conscious in a new way and maybe, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I can never know that you know. This side of heaven. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, oh, yeah. There was one statement I did want to. Um, let me just I'll put it up on the screen here before we split into groups and hear the scripture. So uh, we've already seen this statement. Progressive Christianity begins with the assumption that nothing is permanent, that everything changes. Um, let me hop to this one. That. Progressive Christianity suggests that answers and absolutes become, can become substitutes for God. That's the thing we end up worshiping is certainty. The answer. Right. The virgin birth. Say it again. The virgin birth. Oh, yeah. You can hold that up, right? And then yeah. everybody questions it. The whole thing comes down and that becomes your God, the belief in that or the belief in an inerrant scripture. Right. Right. That becomes the God. The minute you question it, then whoop, the whole thing goes. Um, lots of things, lots of beliefs, lots of answers can become substitutes for God. And, and, and by substitutes for God, again, the word that we see in scripture often is idolatry. 
that's what idolatry is is when you when you create a substitute for god a human creation and that's not just something made of wood or but but it's an ideology as well right um it's the way we think of things the values that we hold those things can in fact become idols in and of themselves substitutes for gods um and we do that of course because we're not comfortable with unknowns and mystery <laughs> it's like um it's actually not rocket science like the reason we do this the reason human beings have the impulse to have answers um for things is because we are deeply uncomfortable with mystery deeply uncomfortable with uncertainty like i am in a a, a I feel like a perpetual uh, place of uncertainty and uncomfort uh, and discomfort, you know, and it's an easy place to be. And yet we're kind of invited back here each time. Um, this, this uh, reality goes right back to Jesus as he's meeting with his disciples for maybe one of the last times. Um, I can't remember where this open uh, upper room Ah, am I remembering the right phrase? And he's reminding them that he is about to face his death. And and I think often that that moment is translated or interpreted as kind of this like um, triumphant moment that his work has been done and he's going to go away. And I, I often imagine a much more despondent Jesus in that moment who says, this is how it has to be. I'm sorry. I wish it could be different. It's not. Um, that the way that I lived has been such an affront to the authorities that the, like they're going to kill me. And if you live the way that I live, then they're going to kill you too. And I'm so, like, I wish it could be different, but it's not, right? Like you are stepping into the great unknown and the risks are real. And, uh, and I just feel like... Um, any substitute for that level of kind of uncertainty <laughs> um, and risk, though very natural, ends up being the thing that we worship rather than this God who sits in the uncertainty, sits in the discomfort and ends up saying, I'm sorry, it can't be any other way. It just is. <laughs> it's, this is just the reality we live in. Okay. Um, another statement about progressive Christianity, it holds that churches ought to be teaching people how to become comfortable with ambiguity and mystery. And boy, isn't that an endless task. So long as this is our goal as a, as a faith community, churches will in fact survive. <laughs> because this is an endless task of how, learning how to become comfortable with ambiguity and mystery, of holding uh, things in paradox and in tension with one another. Um, yeah, I don't know about that. Like, I hope, I hope we're up to it, right? Like, this is, this is our, this is our commission as far as I understand it um, as pastors, but as people in faith is, is how able are we to um to sit in a place of ambiguity and find some comfort in it i don't know anyway any any thoughts on that you, sit in, you, you sit in the ocean you sit in the water and the water is constantly changing and yet you're very comfortable paddling around in the changing water so all right lift that up to you're on land and you're in the sea of changing ideas and changing cultures and how do we become comfortable with that well mm -hmm. if we can do it in the water we can do it on earth I I also I if you look at the uh, traditions uh you can even use them as a guide yeah a paradox in all of our traditions that's right uh, <clears throat> jesus is fully human and fully right. divine now is that an absurdity I mean, it's the way they did a paradox. That's the way they did an ambiguity. Mm -hmm. Jesus cannot be 200%. But yep. <laughs> there it is. It's a doctrine of the church. Uh, the Trinity is another doctrine of the church. Uh, no matter how you explain the Trinity, unless you have God in Jesus, Jesus in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in God, they... And 
all of these, all three co-mingle mm -hmm. in some kind of weird paradox, yeah. you don't have the truth about the Trinity. If you're just doing three leaves on a tree or something like that as Trinity, that's just a child's understanding. It's a paradox and it's not understandable. Yeah, thank you, um, Walter, for that too. And I think as well, so many other different faith traditions honor this much better and more consistently than we do in Western Christianity. Um, because sometimes we forget that or we try to simplify the paradoxes in our own faith. But of course, the Buddhist tradition, oh my gosh, I think I think more than any other that I'm aware of, um, honors the paradox, the unknown, the mystery um, as well. If we, don't, if we don't have the mystery, if we don't, if we had confirmations that we believed, there would be no faith. There you go. Right. That's exactly, I mean, that's exactly right. Um, and we forget that, I think, sometimes. We redefine faith as something different, right? than what it really is which is just what you're saying Catherine absolutely um do I have one more thing before we move on um can you put that statement up again the the, the last one the per well that, I said, the I said oh, that, that one this oh one, that one yeah, yeah. Is, this, is this what you're talking about Lynn yes yeah I was just I just wanted to read it again so yeah I mean what Catherine was saying is that faith actually assumes mystery and mystery by, by definition is unknown and whether we gather together as a community to kind of ponder the meaning of life and to ponder what we mean by the term God what we are referring to is this infinite mystery <laughs> which is what, what progressive Christianity is saying and kind of maybe progressive Christianity rather than something new is a reclaiming of something old which is probably the most likely, like to be clear. Um, uh, we always find ourselves, ourselves don't we? Um, oh, my, my question, and again, I fear that we're kind of running out of time here, but my question that was associated with this value is kind of, Catherine, what you were about to say. First of all, it was how does the term infinite mystery make you feel? And then the second one is how would you define the word faith? And I think you did it beautifully, Catherine, by saying, actually, it really assumes this a paradox. It assumes mystery. It assumes unknown, without which there is actually no faith. Faith is nothing. It's certainty. Oh. It's different. It's something entirely different. Well, we have to have affirmations, but we have to be open to the fact that our affirmations might change. That's right. Yes. And it's Not absolute. I can remember when uh, the Lutheran church tried to teach me that Christ died for my sins. Mm. And I didn't feel very sinful. I didn't think I was sinful. My dad tried mm -hmm. to tell us we were, but I didn't believe it. Uh, <laughs> and so when I got to the UC, so I said those, you know, those I, I believe in God, the Father Almighty things for a long time, not really believing them. And then I got to the UCC, and when uh, when the second part of that comes, you know, about Jesus mm. saving us, how, oh, how does it say it? Aimlessness and sin. From aimlessness, aimlessness and, and sin. Oh, it does use the word sin. But by that time, I understood to be sin, not as actions, mm. but as a separation from God. Yeah, yeah. That is sin. Whatever we do, it might be eating too much. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and I separate myself from God every time I eat too much because I say, damn it, God, why did you let me do that? <laughs> oh, oh, see, this is the, this is what I mean by saying, oh, there's like infinite <laughs> discussion to have here, right? So we really could go, if you were so inclined, through each of the big Christianese words, right? We could talk about sin and what it might mean in all of its breadth and diversity from a progressive point of view. We could talk about salvation. Oh my gosh, we'd be here all year. And right. I, you know, I mean, all these vast concepts um, that we uh, 
I mean, we you hear every Sunday, they're they're woven into our songs, they're woven into our prayers, they're woven in, and, and we don't stop to kind of think, oh, are we understanding this how I grew up in understanding it? Am I just suspending? I'm just allowing, I'm just letting the word be and I'm not questioning it because I don't believe what I used to believe, but I, I don't really know how to articulate what I believe right now about that particular thing. So whether it's crucifixion or uh, or, or kind of what crucifixion accomplished um, or I mean, there's so many different things uh, that we say that we really don't explain or um, reinterpret with a progressive lens. Uh, we don't do that intentionally often. And we just assume y'all are doing it. <laughs> and that, and, that, and that we assume that the pastors mean the same thing as you mean. And we may not mean the same thing you mean. And we may not mean the same thing as each other means. <laughs> um, so anyway, this is why we have midweek Bible studies. Okay. Let's jump in to the scripture. We are going to go to Second Peter. Now, I know we just had a series on First Peter, at least the first three chapters of Peter. We're jumping to Second Peter. You guys are so well versed now in the context in which this letter was written to persecuted Gentile Christians. Um, lots of equating Christ's suffering with their suffering in order to find meaning um, and, and kind of fortitude and perseverance uh, for kind of the uncertainty of, uh, of the future. Would they be forever persecuted? Is this actually worth it? Um, those were the kind of questions this community was asking. And Peter, as I suggested in Mother's Day, took a mothering strategy and saying, yes, it is worth it. And this is why. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 kind of offering somewhat of an absolute around it. It's worth it because you are suffering just like Christ Jesus suffered. And because Christ Jesus suffered in such a way as to bring about a uh, new life in his resurrection again, you will also taste that very same thing uh, after your suffering, even if it comes after your death. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, of course, we, you know, we kind of breeze over that bit. Oh, you will, in fact, die also. Um, so let's go to Second Peter. And uh, hang on, I want someone else to read this so that you don't hear my voice again. Who hasn't spoken to me? Uh, Terry, can I pick on you? Would you read these verses for me? Um, so what I've done is I try to uh, pare it down a little bit. 21 verses seemed an awful lot, um, our final thing. So I've got two verses at the very beginning of chapter one, and then a few more at the very end. So here we go. Oh, can I do it? I'm not helping you, am I? There we go. This divine power has given us everything needed for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Thus, he has given us through these things, his precious and very great promises so that through them you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of lust and may become participants in the divine nature. Okay. Thank you. There we go. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we were made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Here ends the lesson. So thank you, Terry. So I hope you see why I picked this scripture for this particular point. <laughs> <laughs> um, all the way back at the beginning here, I'm just going to review it real quick. 
but if you do have your Bible with you, do flip to it. If you can find Second Peter, it's teeny, teeny, tiny, very close to the end. <laughs> um, you may need your contents page to find it. Um, I always say to the, I always say to the youth, there is no shame in using the contents page. That's why it's there. So just because you haven't memorized the location of Second Peter, doesn't matter. I don't, I don't care about that. Find it in the contents page. <laughs> anyway, um, the reason I picked this te text may be obvious, but just to point out exactly why. So our core value today was that we would be lifelong learners, that we would, um, uh, what was, oh gosh, I can't even remember the phrasing of the thing. Uh, by Colin Seffer, we, we, we are Christians that commit to a path of lifelong learning, believing that there's more value in questioning than in absolutes. And again, for many of us who grew up in a not particularly progressive uh, faith background, of course, we were told not to question. Uh, I'm glad, Lynn, that you grew up in a confirmation setting where you were we were invited to question. Um, but often that is seen as a threat. And so uh, it is not uncommon to, to be like, no, you, you shouldn't question that. This is capital T truth, and it stands. And so we have a passage like this, of course, that says, this divine power has given us everything needed for life and godliness so <laughs> so basically that has the potential that statement has the potential to say you don't need anything else you don't need to bring in contemporary science you don't need to bring in issues of justice that that's in the 19th or 20th century you don't need to bring in diverse identities like um trans people and, and non-binary people i mean um this is everything needed for life and all god on all godliness okay so that might be one way of understanding this through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness da -da -da -da. um you know, it gives you a reason why you want to accept this is true. Uh, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths. We didn't make it up. It wasn't false. Now, there's there's other definitions of myths that, um, but anyway, I think what, what Peter, how our, our English translation is understanding myths in this idea is stories made up that, that have questionable value in terms of truth. <laughs> Um, I think that's how our translator, at least our English translator, is using the word myth here. We did not uh, follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses. This is trustworthy. Uh, eyewitnesses of his majesty. Um, I did love in verse 17, they call it they call God majestic glory here. I had never noticed that before, but I don't, I haven't sat very long with second Peter, I must confess, but um, for he received glory and honor from God, the father, when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory saying this. And so we referring to Jesus baptism and we heard, we ourselves heard this voice. Fascinating statement, right? We ourselves heard this voice coming from heaven while we were with them on the holy mountain. Now, are they talking about Jesus in the water at baptism um, in the River Jordan? For that's not on a mountain. What holy mountain are they talking about? The mountain of transfiguration. Could it be the, yeah, maybe it's transfiguration. Okay, yeah. So we, we need to locate the statement. Of course, we know, yeah, thank you, Diane, for reminding us. It wasn't just in the river that... Um, that that voice heard right but but again only a limited number of people were there of course he's saying trust us we heard it firsthand and then oh shmankies come on there we go then this statement which i find fascinating too so we have the pr prophetic message more fully confirmed. We saw it. We're eyewitnesses. We, we have it confirmed. Um you will do well to be attentive to this um uh, as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts uh you will be enlightened like we are enlightened <laughs> even though you haven't seen it firsthand of course these are gentile christians um and oh gosh whoops 
Oh dear, I haven't got control of my functions here. Um, but first of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. This verse in particular was why I selected our verse today, because this challenges, on the face of it at least, exactly what we're talking about. We're saying actually there is beauty and diversity of interpretation that everything is interpreted. The fact that we are reading this in English is in fact an interpretation of an of an interpretation of an interpretation. Um, but uh, no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by human will. Now that might of course indeed be true. Um, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And we, of course, belong to a tradition that says that God is still speaking. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Let me get my questions up and get out of this screen. Um, and they're not going to be that different from the questions that you've had um, from weeks past. I want to know what questions you have of this particular passage anything there's no such thing as stupid questions um what have you got any brave films well we know they were gentile christians but what were they experiencing that peter is speaking to them in this way yeah that's a that's always a great question actually what were the experience? It speaks to the context. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, great question. And even though you think you know, so this is what I've discovered as well, even though you think you know something of their context, it's always good to ask the question again, <laughs> um, uh, to kind of go on that journey again and open yourself up to kind of learn new things about the context. Any other questions about this scripture? Um, I think we we perhaps preempted it by by kind of revisiting that statement. Um, this is my son, whom I'm well pleased. The question would have been, where is that from? Like, what are they referring to? What event are they referring to? Referring to? Um, again, you may have previous biblical knowledge that tells you, oh, I recognize that statement from somewhere. You may not know exactly where. Saying, okay, there's, there's something being quoted here. What event are they? referring to so i think that that's always good too when there is a quotation within the scripture itself uh trying to find out where they're pulling it from often it's the old testament um but and with some changes often the old testament is often uh quoted in the new testament but, but it's often not without changes and often not without being maybe melded together with another passage from somewhere it's a composite what we're reading is a composite um uh, and so ask it asking where does that come where does that event come from where does that statement come from is often helpful as well because our writers and our biblical inter uh, biblical authors are often weaving together many traditions um yeah from hebrew bible or from the gospels or whatever um Another question is that, oh, it, says that um, prophecy is God's gift and therefore we need to know God's intention uh -huh. before we can really believe in a prophecy that comes. Isn't yeah. that what he's saying? I mean, it's God's prophecy. God is the author of all prophecy. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what verse it was now. And mm -hmm. so we have to be aware of the intention. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, there, I mean, so we have to sit around in groups of 10 and discuss what we think God's intention was. Yeah. When so, delivered a particular prophecy. Yeah. And I mean, and even before we even get there, we could be like, okay, what is prophecy? <laughs> is a great question it's mentioned a couple of times here what is prophecy because sometimes we um we define it as like oh gosh we're three minutes to eight fortune telling anyway yeah fortune yeah. fortune telling right and we need to remind ourselves actually that's not what prophecy is biblically at least yeah. 
Testament, but of course, prophecy and our understanding of prophecy has changed from Old Testament times or can change. Again, we're lifelong learners, so change is constant. What might prophecy mean today? Am I imposing a contemporary meaning of prophecy? What does Peter mean of prophecy? So, like, it's always good. And again, what this kind of, again, I'm trying to wind up without any answers, um, but um, because we're almost. <laughs> But I know, I know uh, it's very apt for this particular evening, of course, of, of when we're just sitting in questions. But um, but I think it's always this kind of approach to scripture, one that is open to possibilities, one that is open to questions, one that doesn't get sucked down the one interpretation route or the one answer route, um, demands quite a lot of time and effort. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Um, and where that can be frustrating and, and something you're just like, I actually just can't commit to that. It's something I think that I hope will be life giving to you um, ultimately um, that's that that enlivens your faith. Um, yeah. Um, and so and, and actually allows this faith to still ring true for you in your circumstances you can say oh yes that does make sense actually oh yes that really does hit to the core mm -hmm. of what I'm experiencing oh yes you know those moments of realization realization that actually this ancient faith in the way it's expressed still can hold meaning today and we didn't get to like a hundred things that I want to discuss today <laughs> well Woe is me, Charmiel, please. Yes. What I, what I was thinking was like, instead of us dropping off of a cliff right now, <laughs> what, what about once a month you continue this? I would dearly love to. I think that might be a great idea. Let's try it. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. How or, about th that would work for me because. Yeah. I, I mean, I feel like, oh my God, we opened this up and now it's over for heaven's sakes. You can't, <laughs> you can't leave us, you know. Um, I would be interested in, in that. I don't know what you all think, but. I mean, why not? Uh, so I love the, it is Have learning we to learn say, the this absolute. is what we are doing, you know, and, huh? Haven't, yeah. haven't we learned the absolute? Haven't we? Uh, yeah, haven't you? You've learned the five core points now, Charmia. What else is? Um, so, how about this? I don't know that we need a consensus right here. How about I make a monthly thing available and then we'll figure it out from there? And if it doesn't, if it flops or if nobody shows up, that's fine too. My feelings won't be hurt. Um, Through the summer, do we have a pastor led series on no. Sunday or Monday night? I don't Not yet. So this this might bridge a gap, I think, actually, on a very busy summer, I will say. So that um because hey, you've got a lot on your plate already. Yeah, but what <laughs> if, what if saying you know how excited I get, Perry? <laughs> somebody to say it's okay to say no. Okay, well, I, I appreciate that. Well, she's at St. Andrew. Uh, you cannot say no. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Dad. You know, pss. somebody who never says no. I'm. I'm <laughs> Y'all are terrible role models when it comes to saying exactly. no, whatever. Um, sorry to call you out on a recorded Zoom call. Um, so I've got a couple things in my head. So, in a sense, where we wouldn't need, to, I I wouldn't have like a, a vast degree of preparation to provide space. For a conversation that would be ongoing so that that is helpful for me yeah. um particularly in a busy summer i think there, there's but there was a question i asked last week about what core values you would add um and i would be interested to having and some of you emailed me which i'm very grateful for and i did not follow up with anybody because i was in a continuing ed event this week but you made me think about so many things um that that says that actually the topics of discussion could be something that you all bring up um, each night. And so we would meet this. It feels like an AA meeting too. We would meet, <laughs> we would have kind of like a, uh, a, a, 
Yeah, does anybody have anything to share that you're mulling about or a question? And we just go from there and we kind of commit to using the lens and maybe I as the, the moderator could remind us of the core values that we've already discussed that we could practice employing them again. Um, anyway, we're leaving, we're leaving at a, at a, I, again, an unsatisfying point, but I'm grateful for your engagement over these six weeks. I'm we sorry. Thank you. I'm yeah. sorry. And I think another, another, um, another fun thing to do is for a person in a group to think back to uh, a Christian value that he or she believed in as a child yeah. that has changed. And then what is it that changed? That's what right. is it that, that, made you see that um what's the scripture as a child i thought as a child i saw as a child and now i see differently uh what is it what are some of the life experiences that uh that that challenge a christian concept of our childhood and bring light to a new understanding of christian faith right Okay, because okay. I'm sure this group particularly nobody believes as he or she did as a child. <laughs> You're probably right there. Yes. <laughs> okay. Note down uh, June nineteenth. I think it might be the only Monday night that I've got for you. Maybe or, or June twenty sixth. No, I'm well. June. Which oh, one? June 27th is the next meeting of the Reproductive Justice Planning Team. So Monday, Monday the 26th. Monday. 23. Oh, 23. Yeah. I keep saying Monday. That's easier for me. Yeah, June 26th is free to know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, hey, look at that. And that's the Monday right before General Synod. So we can talk about kind of the future of the church then, too, if you like. But, um, <laughs> but um, yeah. Okay. So put it in June 26th. And I will. That's a good question. You know, how do you, as the church, how do you teach people? As the pastor of the church, how do you teach people to be comfortable with ambiguity? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mulling that over the next six weeks and then come, <laughs> come, with, come with the answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But no, I'm, I'm grateful. And again, I think as you go through this month, perhaps the thing to do is just to be, I mean, be a sponge, right? Um, these five val uh, core values, you will see now play out um, in in church, but well, well beyond church, right? Um, and again, as, as, as you engage with the world, I'll be interested to hear how you're seeing these values really do, do the work <laughs> of, of kind of like a practical faith living um, on, on the day-to-day -day as well.